My name is Ian Ewer, and welcome to my talk, Old McCarthy Had a Forum. In this talk, I'm going to be discussing EIEIO, which is an Emacs Lisp implementation of the Common Lisp object system. Clause is a way of writing object-oriented Common Lisp code, and with EIEIO, you have much of that same power, but inside Emacs. I'm going to be using those two names interchangeably throughout this talk, since they're nearly equivalent. You might wonder, why would I want to write object-oriented Emacs Lisp code? I like it because I like writing in a functional programming style, or I like to do an imperative style that captures interactive key sequences that I might enter manually. Well, I think different kinds of programs need different kind of programming paradigms, and sometimes OOP is the one that fits. Also, if you've done much OOP before, you might be surprised by how EIEIO works and the sorts of power that it brings to your programs. So let's talk about that model now. Classes are pretty much what you would expect if you've done OOP programming before. In cl the clause model, they only have fields. They only encapsulate values. They don't have anything to do with methods. So in this case, we have a base class for an EMMS player backend, and it has one field, and uh, a slot is what it's called in clause terminology, which indicates whether it's playing or not. And it's declared abstract, so you can't create an instance of an object based on this class. You can only extend it with another class. That's an EIAO extension, but I think it's a pretty good one. You can also see there's a class that implements an MPV player backend, and it extends the base class. It doesn't add any slots, and those get inherited from the base class. If you want these to do much more than encapsulate data, you need to start writing methods. The clause model is to have a generic function. A generic function is kind of like an interface. It's just a name and an argument list, and there's no implementation. You have to write a method in order to have an actual implementation. When you call the generic function, the system will do a dynamic dispatch to a method that matches based on its argument types and how the method has declared that it should be invoked. Here's an example of some methods for our MPV player backend. You can see that it will tell it'll play anything other than uh, something with a keyword of unplayable. And it just has dummy start and stop methods that return started and stopped text. A method is just one implementation of a generic function, and you can have as many as you need. In order to determine which method gets dispatched when you call a generic function, they're specialized based on their argument type. In this case, you can see that first argument says player talk emms player mpv. That means that if that first argument is an instance of that MPV player or a subclass of it, then those methods will be invoked unless there's a more specific one based on that argument type. You don't have to define the generic functions. If you define a method, then it'll implicitly define the generic function for you. Specialization is really powerful. It lets the methods define how they get invoked. If you've done much programming in Clojure, this sounds a little bit like multi-methods. But with multi-methods, only the main method, the equivalent of the generic function, can determine how they're dispatched. So as the writer of an interface, you might not be able to foresee every way that someone who's implementing a, a version of that interface would like to dispatch. Clause doesn't have that problem. You get to define your own uh, invocation semantics. You're also not limited to dispatching based on the value being a subclass of an EIEIO type. You can dispatch based on a primitive type like integer. You can dispatch based on the value. Uh, you can dispatch on multiple arguments. And there's also a default dispatch that will get applied if there's no others uh, that are defined. If you don't have a default, then you'll just get an error from the system. And if that doesn't cover it, you can even define your own. Definition is with the CL generic generalizers, which is itself a generic function. Much of clause is built in clause, which I think is really cool. In addition to all that, you have four different types of methods, and those are distinguished by what's called a qualifier. Every function can have methods that are that have all four different types of qualifiers, and based on your class inheritance, you might have multiple of each type. There's the primary method, which is equivalent to the method in any other OOP system. So we're not going to cover that too much. Then there's a before method. This is evaluated before the primary method for side effects, and its, its return value is discarded. There's an after method, which is the same, but happens after the method has finished evaluating. And then there's an around method. That happens around all the other three. And by using these types of methods and using class inheritance to compose them into your classes, you can add some really powerful mix-in type functionality. 
You can use before and after to build things like logging, and you can use around to implement things like memoization. If you've done much Emacs Lisp programming, those before, after, and around might jog your memory, because they're the same features you get with Emacs's built-in function advice. The thing with function advice is that it only works on functions in the global namespace, and there's no kind of conditionality. They always get dispatched when that function is invoked. The nice thing about the clause system is that whether they get invoked or not depends on whether they exist in the class hierarchy. So you can add them to your class hierarchy if you want that extra functionality, like logging or memoization, and you can exclude it if you don't. I think that's really powerful and a very, a very interesting way of doing it. It also supports multiple inheritance, which is the mechanism that you can use to compose all these different kinds of behaviors into a single object that does all the things that you want. Here's a quick example of a logger. So you can see the class just has a single slot called messages. It has a log method that pushes a new message, which is a format string, into that. And then it'll return them back out, or it'll just return the latest. And there's a simple example that shows it logging and then shows it coming back out. Pretty much what you would expect. Here's another class that adapts the EMMS player to the logger class. It only extends the logger because it doesn't need any features of the EMMS player class itself. It just implements methods that dispatch based on it being that logging player class. And you can see it logs whenever a track is started or stopped. And it also uh, adds some track to tell you whether or not the track was playable. That is uh, using the around method. So you can see we have all three methods, before, after, and around in this class. So you can see how those work. Then you need one more, which is the class that mixes it all together. So that's the logging player MPV, and it extends both the logging player class and the EMMS player MPV class. What's really interesting about this is that even though the logging player is part of the EMMS player hierarchy, it doesn't depend on a specific implementation. So you can combine the two different classes. That lets the logging class only care about logging and the EMMS player class only care about playing. And that is a really nice way of separating your concerns that I think is very powerful. Here's a quick example of just how that works. And you can see the unplayable track is not playable and it gets logged as such. Foo is playable and you can see the logs and started and stopped. So you can see it's having the side effects from those methods and it's also um, returning the, the value off the player as well. I think this system has a bunch of really nice properties. First and foremost, it feels like a normal Lisp. All you're doing is calling functions. There's no magic involved. Also, you can use either or both of the classes or generic functions. If you only need to encapsulate data into a structure, then you can only use classes. You don't have to use generic functions. And if you only need dynamic dispatch, you can only implement a generic function and methods. You don't get forced into a model where you have to use both. You can mix and match for whatever needs your program has, which I think is really amazing. Any value can conform to an interface, uh, meaning a generic function. So you don't have to use those classes. You can even implement a generic function over nil, which gives you those really nice properties of Lisp where you have nil punning. You know, if you take the head of a nil list, then the output is nil. But you can do that with your object system too. And a really nice feature of that is that you have no possibility of null pointer exceptions like you do in other languages. They have a calling convention where you call object.method. But in clause, you call a generic function and you just give it some arguments. Typically, the first one is going to be an EAIO class object, uh, but it doesn't have to be. But because you're not calling that instance of an object, there's nothing to be nil in the first place, so there's no possibility of a nil pointer exception. And then the ability to have multiple inheritance and mix in all of these different functionalities into your final object is very powerful. Because it's because you have multiple inheritance, your final object that composes all of those things is both a player and a logger, and it can be substituted into code that expects either of them. It's not an adapter class that only allows you to do one thing. It does both of them. I think that's amazing. So here are some practical examples where I think maybe this could be a good idea. And I like to think about what is OOP actually good for? And I think it has three really amazing powers, encapsulation, abstraction, and extensibility. So let's look at those. Encapsulation is just keeping related data together. Here's an example from the transmission torrent client. In order for it to work, it needs to have all four of these variables set consistently. 
But if you use the customization interface, they're kind of strewn all over the buffer because that shows them alphabetically by variable name instead of grouping them logically by function. You also have all these in the global namespace, so you need this disambiguation in front. You have to have a transmission prefix, so it's kind of ugly. An alternative example would be to encapsulate all of that in a, in a single class. This has one slot for each of those values, except the username and password is broken out. There was only one in the previous example, but it works pretty much the same. The really neat thing about this is that the customization interface understands how to customize EIEIO objects. So you can set your custom var variable to the value of an object, and in the customization interface, it shows you all of the fields, and it lets you edit the values of those slots directly. So that keeps that logical grouping that I think makes things really easy to use. Another thing it's really good at is abstraction. And this is really core to a lot of what Emacs does because it runs on so many different systems and it uh, works with so many different kinds of similar tools. Here's an example from the built-in SQL implementation. This is the definition of the Postgres backend. There's one of these for every supported database backend. And you can see this is a pretty classic interface abstraction pattern. On the left hand side, you have a symbol that's common among all the database backends and that code that doesn't have that doesn't know about the implementation can use no matter what implementation is being specified. And on the right hand side, you have the implementation specific values. In some cases, these are just strings or regexes and in others, those are actual functions. So really, this already is object orientation It's just an ad hoc system for it. But you don't have to use an ad hoc system because there's this nice formal one instead. Another thing that it's really good at is, is extensibility. We saw some of that with the EMMS player example earlier. But here's another thing I think it would be interesting to explore. Emacs has this idea of derived modes where you have a mode that's based on another. And that's a pretty clear inheritance pattern straight out of OOP as far as I'm concerned. So what would it look like if major modes were EIEIO classes and you could extend your mode by extending the class? I think that's a really interesting idea, and I'd like to explore that more. In conclusion, I think EIEIO is amazing, and I had no idea that such a powerful object orientation system was available in Emacs. My goal with this talk is for anyone who writes Emacs Lisp to look at these classes of problems, encapsulation, abstraction, and extensibility. And if you run into those problems in your code, instead of immediately reaching and building your own system, I want you to think, oh, there's a thing for that, and I can just use it. That's my talk. Thanks. Hack on.